Following its nose, the Gwati is led to the very summit of a great tree. Monkeys with prehensile tails are better equipped to feed up here. But though the Kawati is no canopy specialist, he's not to be denied. He searches for the ripest fruit. His castoffs feed a band of Kawati females and their young on the forest floor. The seeds would never survive beneath their parent tree anyway, where specialized fungi and insects wait to prey upon them. Animals connect the sunlit canopy with the earth below in many ways. Flowers are designed to attract animals, but leafcutter ants are not invited guests. They strip palatable blooms en masse. Millions of ants working together, collecting the bounty of the canopy and sucking it down into the earth below. Whether they are carried or just float down, bits of fallen canopy are rapidly recycled back into living matter. Fingers of slime mold spread over the leaf litter, breaking it down into plant food. The gossamer threads of fungi help the roots of trees absorb 95% of the nutrients, building forest giants that rise up into the light. The leaf litter hides many miracles. A strawberry frog guards its eggs, which develop in a puddle of rainwater. As soon as the tadpole hatches, she moves it to a more secure nursery, encouraging it to wriggle up onto her back. No bigger than a thumbnail, she undertakes a phenomenal commute, heading straight up. She climbs in search of a bromeliad, an epiphyte with a rosette of leaves that channel rain and mist into a central reservoir. This tiny ocean in the sky comes complete with miniature sea monsters, mosquito larvae, feeding on rotting debris, which also acts as fertilizer for the plant. She drops her tadpole off into the first empty reservoir she finds. But her work is not yet done. She has other tadpoles stashed in other bromeliads, and every two days she makes the rounds. Her offspring's telltale vibrations signal her to lay another egg, but this egg isn't fertile. It's dinner. It's her tadpole's only food, a brilliant strategy for survival, until a thirsty kawati happens by. It takes researchers years to discover such elaborate strategies, and just seconds for a kawati to send them astray. The sky-high world of epiphytes is made up of millions of such little life and death dramas. I love epiphytes. I don't know why I do. I think it's something about they live in the treetops. And ever since I was a little kid, I like climbing trees. It was a world I could escape to. No grown-ups. No grown-ups climb trees. So it was just my little world where I could go up and read and 
It's been 17 years, and every time I put on my Jumars and go up a rope, it's that same feeling of exhilaration of what will I find today? <laughs> The rainforest canopy yields its secrets to only the most determined explorers. It took Neil Reddick 14 years to return to Guyana and his work with the Harpy Eagle. I think what's at the center of the connection of the canopy is, for me, a link back to my youth when I was a 23-year-old wild adventurer. Just the odors of the flowers and the bird calls opened up all these memory banks, sort of been shut down for all those years. It was unbelievable. It was just like I had never left. A harpy's calls helped lead Neil to its nest, just a few miles from his old study site. Neil was now one of the world's best wildlife cinematographers, but he was as thrilled as ever to set eyes on a harpy chick. It was like having a reunion with an old friend. Possibly one of the new adults was the baby from 1975. For six months, Neil kept his vigil. As he watched the chick grow, he wondered if he would finally capture the maiden flight of a harpy on film. Every day brought Neil and the chick closer to their goal. While Neil watched, the chick prepared, exercising and testing its wings. Then one day, Neil turned the camera on just in time. A long-awaited milestone for the chick, its mother, and perhaps most of all, for Neil. Such long-term dedication has coaxed a few of its secrets from the canopy. But as the light of day fades, a cloak of mystery descends. frontier in canopy exploration beckons out of the gathering dark. Few have dared to climb into this high-flung wilderness at night when it comes alive with a whole different community of animals. They come out to reap the bounty the canopy built by day. Bats are the unsung heroes of the rainforest. They hover over the branches, sniffing out the ripest fruit. Only just able to carry its prize, it flies to a roost where it can feed in safety.
Bats play vital roles in pollination, insect control, and the reproduction of trees. The bat eats the sweet flesh of the fruit, but discards the seeds. Here they fall far from their parent tree, where they have a better chance of surviving. Animals help many canopy plants reproduce. Epiphytes face unique challenges spreading their seeds around the hanging gardens. One solution, a sticky coating that keeps the seeds from falling to the forest floor and attracts a particular species of ant. These ants are strong enough to win the tug of war with the plant. They carry them to their nest, but they eat only the nutritious coating, leaving the seeds to sprout. The seedlings grow, turning the nest into a garden overflowing with the ant's favorite food plants, some of which are never found anywhere else. A canopy mouse quenches its thirst in a mouse-sized bromeliad. Mice eat epiphyte seeds and are in turn eaten themselves by boas. Its flicking tongue tastes the victim's presence as it follows it out onto the thinnest vine. Sometimes there's nowhere to go, but down. Spreading its limbs like a parachute, the mouse crashes through foliage, hurtling six stories down. It weighs so little, Air resistance slowed its fall enough so that it landed safely. One of the benefits of being a small creature in the canopy. Small animals thrive in rainforest canopies the world over. In the great Amazon basin, they could travel from treetop to treetop for thousands of miles. The woolly opossum was thought to be one of the rarest of the Amazon's creatures. Its prehensile tail is naked at the tip to give it a strong grip. They are built like little wrestlers. Babies cling tightly to their mothers, who grasp the thinnest of lianas with powerful feet. Those without a family in tow have more freedom of movement. They are all searching for sweets. They drink nectar and eat fruit. The mother must seek her dinner elsewhere. Using aerial roots as a ladder, she follows another sweet scent. So sweet is this perfume, it distracts the lone opossum from its meal. The aroma of ripe banana proves irresistible. Mother and offspring are lucky to have missed this treat.
The woolly opossum finds the morning light unnerving. By now, it should be hidden in the darkness of its lair. But it has no need to fear. The trap was set by biologist Jay Malcolm, who's exploring the night world of the canopy, with some startling results. These woolly opossums are the single most abundant mammal in this forest, more abundant than any other kind of rodent, more abundant than any kind of monkey or any other kind of mammal. And that was a total surprise. People knew that there were things up there, we just didn't know how many or where, so when we started doing this, everything we found out was brand new. Gaining access to the canopy and putting traps up in the canopy has really allowed us to enter a new world, a new realm of, of research. We know almost nothing. There's new species of small mammals, so there are promised to be a lot more surprises. Off you go. From museum rarity to common critter, they just had to look for it in the right place. To service his many traps each day, Jay learned an ancient technique of tree climbing. This thing called a pekonya, or foot belt. It's the same method that the Amerindians have always used to climb up palm trees. And the way it works is what you're really doing, you're sort of pushing out against your heels. So you're really sort of turning your feet into a pair of pliers. To climb seven stories in a matter of seconds requires incredible skill, strength, and stamina. Should he lose his grip, even for an instant, he would crash to the ground below. Having attached a small pulley, he raises the simple and ingenious frame for his trap. Once it is in place, he slides down like a fireman on a very long and rough pole. Then he simply raises his trap into position, where it'll await an overnight guest. Jay finds that he captures opossums only within the undisturbed canopy. Canopy animals are stopped short where the fabric of the forest is slashed by a clear cut. 13 years after the chainsaw stopped, this place is still a no man's land, a desert. An area that's been cut over and used, and you know what it's like walking down there. It's hot, full of all sorts of burrs and messy stuff. From a life standpoint, it's been basically trashed. There's not much left there. It's just a, a tragedy. Despite efforts to save it, the rainforest is being consumed at an unprecedented rate, lending an air of urgency to canopy exploration. But in the face of such a huge problem, you have to dream larger still. A lighter-than-air arc ascends with the dawn. Suspended beneath is the canopy luge, a sled bearing excited researchers on the trip of their lives. Among them is one of the founders of the field, Meg Lauman, who's explored canopies the world over. But today, she goes where no one has gone before. Their mission, to trawl the green sea of the canopy to get some inkling of the biological riches it contains. The blimp maneuvers the luge carefully, sidling up to a tree crown 150 feet in the air. 
As soon as they are close enough to reach, nets are wielded frantically. They scoop up insects and collect whole branches in an all-out effort to gather as many samples of canopy life as quickly as they can. It would have taken weeks of difficult and dangerous climbing to get the samples they amass in just one morning on the luge. The luge is part of Operation Canopy, which invites the best researchers the world over to join its venture. They also use the Canopy Raft, a web-like platform dropped over the crowns of several trees. Walking atop the swaying trees is like walking on the face of the sea. I guess I feel really special walking on the tops of trees and I really tiptoe all the time because I'm frightened of disturbing these poor little buds or snapping a branch. But in actual fact, with the raft and its wonderful mesh floor, our weight is dispersed really nicely. Meg's work in the treetops has shown that over millions of years, plants evolved poisons to defend themselves from being eaten, while insects evolved ways to overcome these toxins. Rainforest plants and insects are waging a biochemical war. The arsenal of poisons and antidotes created by canopy plants and animals are a pharmaceutical gold mine. They are the stuff that medicines are made of. Who knows what cures to what dread diseases may be hidden among the samples collected by the crew of Operation Canopy. Each evening, the best canopy scientists in the world share a meal, along with their ideas. By swapping techniques, samples and data, they are beginning a new era in canopy research. They've blazed a trail into the last biological frontier, opening this eighth continent to exploration. Upon their shoulders, the next generation can scale new heights. Today, Canopy Tours offer a thrilling new perspective on life. But the greatest thrill is realizing we are part of this beautiful world floating above our own, for good or ill. The same pioneering spirit that brought us up into the canopy has given us the power to destroy it. Canopy explorers have given us a unique opportunity to save this amazing world. We have a choice. It's up to us which path we take.